What is up, Humanoid Nation? It has been a while since I done a reaction. It's time to get back to it with some wrestling reaction for this time. This channel is by Wrestling with Andy. Here and gone. Wrestling's short lip gimmicks. Let's see what Andy's a great YouTuber. Does his homework. Really amazing stuff he does. Uh, what was that Krizarni gimmick one time that wasn't used one time? And Emelina using one time, but let's see what Wrestling with Andy has. Here and gone. Let's do this. Wrestling has had a long and storied history of lengthy gimmicks which have stood the test of time. In the modern era alone, in fact, the likes of John Cena's patriotic babyface star, Randy Orton's slimy heel, and Brock Lesnar's Hulk on steroids character. Hulk on steroids, yes. Seen them find success across Jesus Christ, Brock Lesnar in his prime was such a beast. Brock Lesnar now is such a beast. Three different decades. And if you want to go even further back than that, you can find any number of lengthy gimmicks, such as Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, or Gorgeous George, each of which gave the person behind them years worth of success. But what happens when a gimmick uh, doesn't quite have XP? Man Mountain no, Wait. That was WCW. Man Mountain Rock. Yeah, Man Mountain Rock. Have that staying power. Either because it wasn't quite working, or because something better came along for the performer. Or either because... Good lord, Terry Gordy looks so... He's, he was, like, not well during his time. Jesus Christ. It wasn't quite working, or because something better came along for the performer. By Tribal well, Chief. That's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we journey into the world of the lost and the forgotten in Brief Encounters, Wrestling's Short-Lived Gimmicks. And where better to start then than with the original gimmick of the man who has? Kind of funny that I'm reacting to this after WrestleMania 40. Our tribal chief has by finally been taken down by the All American Nightmare Cody Rhodes. But goddamn, Roman Reigns had such a great championship run. Regardless if you hate him, if you love him or hate him, this man had a great championship run. In the years since, gone on to become arguably the biggest star in all of wrestling, and that's Roman Liaki. Of course, before he was the tribal chief, before he was the big dog, even before he was the enforcer of the shield, Roman was a young rookie hoping to make a name for himself in WWE's developmental brand at the time, Florida Championship Wrestling. And given his lineage as part of the NOIE family, combined with his prior runs in the football world as part of both the Minnesota Vikings and the Jacksonville Jaguars, he wouldn't have to work hard to get noticed. As realized Didn't he get cut from his team a month late after he found out he had leukemia? And the team, the, yeah. He got cut a month after he got diagnosed. That's pretty, that's, that's cold. That's so cold. ...how big of a potential star they had on their hands early on, the company would get hard to work on molding him to meet his full potential. This then would see him debut in FCW in 2010 then as Roman Liaki, a cocky heel who, always dressed sharply in a suit, would regularly inform his opponents about how much better he was than A them. baby tribal chief. But it wasn't like this was all talk, as when it came time to hit the ring, he'd be able to back this up with his fists, too. With this thirst to win ultimately being what saw him defeat then FCW Florida heavyweight champion Leo Kruger in a non Why is there so much in garbage in 2012? Had he stayed on with the developmental territory after that, then it's likely he would have been the champion himself before long. I thought I'd clean this in out. The There's so much paper in this. Happen, FCW would be rebranded as NXT, with Liaki at this point changing his ring name to Roman Reigns. And it was this name that he would take up to the main roster with him just a few months later when, at November 18th, 2012 Survivor Series pay-per-view, he, Seth Rollins, and Dean Ambrose would all debut together as The Shield. Shield. Yes, at this point, Roman's... Was I the only one hoping that John Moxley was going to... Not hoping. I was. I thought John Moxley was going to show up at Nate 2 when The Shield music came out. Seth Rollins came in and got his ass kicked, but for a second there, I thought Moxley was going to show up career would take a dramatic turn as he quickly rocketed up the card that said it wouldn't be until he went back to his heelish roots in 2020 and became god mode fans in a major way proving that maybe he'd been onto something way back in the beginning all along of course not all short emelina bigger success for the performers behind them after the fact though as in the case of emelina things would not go as well 
And what made this one worse is that prior to her rebranding, over on NXT, Australian wrestler Emma had already found success as a goofy babyface who liked to badly dance her way. Damn, I forgot Brandy was a ring announcer for NXT. Yeah, that's a while back. The ring. But it wasn't just dancing that got her over as when was that Brandy? The ring herself, she or am I just being racist? Bangers with Paige that, in <laughs> hindsight, represented the very first sparks of the company's women's revolution. Upon reaching the main roster in 2014, though, she would never be able to find the same level of success as her chief rival, with her instead quickly falling into an undercard comedy role as the on-screen ally of Santino Morella. So realizing that things needed to be shaken up, WWE would take her off TV for a while in 2016, with them at this point beginning the very, very long tease of her eventual return. Very long Evelina. tease. So goddamn long. Yes, this one would go on for such a lengthy period that it would eventually turn into a bit of a joke amongst fans, with many wondering if the re-debut would ever happen after a certain point. Then, to make matters worse, Emelina would finally make her debut on the February 13th, 2017 episode of Raw. And then she just leaves. And to immediately announce that she would now begin the transition of returning to Emma once more. Why was it so abrupt? Was it just some in-joke being played by people behind the scenes? Well, if rumors are to be believed, the whole thing was actually supposed to go on for longer. But upon seeing that the naturally goofy Emma was struggling to play the more sexualized Sable-like gimmick, the company decided to switch gears and have her go back to her old look instead. So in terms of short- And then she went back to being Tennille Dashwood and was a smoke machine. Couldn't play sexy, huh? Okay. All right, Vince McMahon era. Okay. Short-lived gimmicks. This one has to rank right up there at the top as, lasting for only one segment, it never even had an opportunity to get over with fans. As for the next performer we're going to be looking at, though, they can't say the same thing. As despite only being around for a short time, the Patriot would spend most of it in the main event scene. The Patriot was there for quite a while. It wasn't like, oh, short-lived gimmicks. I thought it was one time, okay. Yeah, he was there for a short time. He had the original Kurt Angle music. It was way back in 1997, in fact, that looking for someone who could challenge then-WWF champion Bret Hart during the ongoing Canada vs. USA storyline, Jim Ross pitched for journeyman wrestler Del Wilkes to be brought in for the role. So... Seeing something in the idea, Vince McMahon would agree to this, as from there, Wilkes was hired and rebranded as the Patriot, an all-American babyface who wore a Stars and Stripes mask, carried an American flag, and came out to the ring to a suspiciously similar-sounding theme song. Original song. Kurt Angle got it later, so it, it was the Patriots first. Yes, it had all the makings of an old-school patriotic character, but unfortunately for Del Wilkes, with this being the era of the anti-hero, fans weren't as interested in him as they made It was the attitude care. They didn't care for the anti-hero, yeah. That was how, after unsuccessfully challenging... He's a great wrestler. ...the WWF title but, at September yeah. 7th's Ground Zero in your house, then teaming with Vader to take on Hart the British Bulldog in a flag match at the following month's Bad Blood in your house, the Patriot would fall to the wayside with him leaving the company altogether soon thereafter upon picking up a pretty bad tricep injury, which ultimately forced him to retire. But it wasn't as bad as it could have been, however, because for as short of a run as the Patriot ultimately had, at least he got to keep his dignity, the same of which can't be said for Paul and Katie Lee Virtual. Oh, supposed incest. They never said it was, they never said they were fucking, but it was implied. It was heavily implied. Yes, this one is remembered for all the wrong reasons, as after spending a period on mid 2000s smack, I love the pirate, pirate gimmick. Virtual, that was a great gimmick. Answer to Captain Jack Sparrow, the cruiserweight star would be paired up with German indie performer Katarina Walters for an altogether more controversial gimmick. That's right, this was the one that saw Waters play the role of Katie Lee Virtual, the on screen sister and, at times, apparent lover to Paul. Look, no one can ever accuse Vince. This was a year ago. We now know how Vince McMahon is a sexual deviant. But yeah, looking back on it, goddamn. Vince McMahon of being a normal guy, and with this idea. Oh, he's not a normal guy if he loves to uh, name his sex toys, sex toys on, uh, from wrestlers. I'm gonna shove the Paul Burchill up your ass, Janelle. I'm so sorry.
being his apparent brainchild, after years of having tried to get some kind of incest storyline on WWE TV, he finally had a chance to let loose with it, even if both the performers involved and the fans watching probably wish they could forget the whole thing ever happened. Now, that said, there was never anything blatant to the love affair between the siblings. The company had sponsors to think about after all. But between the act's debut in 2008 and its eventual end, enough hints would be dropped so that even the least perceptive of fans could figure out what was really going on. Luckily then, after runs on both the Raw and ECW brands, by 2010 it would be no more. And with Vince McMahon hopefully having finally gotten the idea out of his... Is it me or does Paul Bircher look like a... More roided up version of Brian Kendrick. Look at him. He has the same hairstyle. If Brian Kendrick was on the juice and much more taller. System now, we can move on and pretend the whole thing was a bad dream. What we never want to forget about, though, is one of the best short lived gimmicks in WWE history, with that being Man, Man Mountain Rock. Rock. But let's be clear Man Mountain Rock, played as he was by indie performer Max Payne, wasn't necessarily a good character. He wasn't even necessarily an entertaining character. He wasn't a he was, good though, wrestler. Was someone so ridiculous looking that we're just glad it existed. Yes, missing out on the heavy metal craze by about a decade or so, Vince McMahon decided that 1995 was the perfect Holy time shit, to make Iron Mike Sharp. Guitar virtuoso who frequently rocked his way down to the ring with his WWF logo shaped instrument. Of course, unlike Elias years later, this one would fail to get over with fans, with the grunge audience of the time having little interest in what he was selling them. And despite Vince McMahon acting as his biggest cheerleader on commentary, it would all ultimately lead to Man Mountain Rock being dropped soon thereafter, albeit not before he got to have a career highlight when his thrashing skills raised the ire of Bob Backlund, leading to the two having a brief comedy feud that gave fans something good to remember the whole thing by. But finding good things to remember a short-lived gimmick by turns it Oh, I feel so sorry for Terry Gordy. Oh, he was not in a good place at that time. Executioner. Uh. Into a far more difficult task when we look at another character that only had a brief run a year or so following this. Yes, it was in 1996 when WWF was transitioning out of the new generation era into one with far more attitude that Terry Gordy would get one last run. Look, look at his eyes, man. He looks so... He, how, like, he's, like, done all the drugs. Jesus Christ. ...with the company as the executioner. Gordy himself had long been a well-respected figure in wrestling by this point, with his time working for the likes of World Class Championship Wrestling, Memphis CWA Wrestling, All Japan Pro Wrestling, and Extreme Championship Wrestling prior to this, helping him earn a well-deserved reputation. By the dawn of the Attitude Era, however, he was starting to get on in years, and that was why, after Vince McMahon brought him back to play the latest foil to The Undertaker, he would decide it was better to put him under a mask so as to hide his age from the audience and protect his legacy if it turned out he couldn't go to the same level anymore. And his sobriety. Yes, this was back during the time when WWF was undergoing a youth kick, with anyone over the age of 40 being deemed to be well past their prime. So upon his debut as the newest client of Paul Bearer then, Fans would have little idea it was the former terror. Completely forgot Executioner was part of Paul Bearer's stable. He was a Paul Bearer guy. Okay, all right. Territory star behind the mask. All they saw instead was the Executioner, someone who came down to the ring with a scythe in hand, seemingly ready to send heads rolling at a moment's notice. But once the bell rang, things would not go to plan for the heel as, in his only real notable bout, taking on the dead man in an Armageddon Rules match at December's In Your House 12. It and what is an Armageddon's Rules match? Is it like a last man standing match before it was called a last man standing match? Texas death match? All I remember is it was like, you gotta get up before the count of 10. Or something like that. It was an awful match. It's time he would be soundly defeated. After this then, he would quickly fall into the background as, by 1997, he would be gone altogether. And as it turned out, he wouldn't be the only short-lived gimmick who appeared around this time, as just a few weeks before the Executioner had his cup of coffee in New York going up against The Undertaker, a hot new prospect would have made his Scott debut, Putsky? and that was Brackus. Ah, uh, close enough. Brackus, Scott Putzky. They both suck. Yes, Brackus, portrayed by German former bodybuilder Achim Albrecht, had caught the attention of Vince McMahon not long prior to this, and given his absolutely monstrous physique making him look like a Vince getting a goddamn boner over this guy. 
it's not hard to see why the boss would fall in love with him. In fact, if he had his way, then Brachus would have likely been pushed to the moon as quickly as possible, with him like Tom McGee. And look what happened there. Oh, this Brachus was the new Tom McGee. Probably ending Jesus up Christ, look at his legs. Jeez, god damn, dude. Small package. Big ass thighs. He has arms. God damn. Challenging for the WWF title before long. In reality, however, things did not go quite like this. Not that it was for lack of trying, though, as after appearing at house shows and on dark matches throughout the tail end of 1996 and into 1997, vignettes would begin airing, hyping up his big Brackets. debut. Coming soon. And in these, he would make it known that his first task in WWF was to take out Vader, with the big man specifically calling out the Mastodon. Unfortunately, though, before he could make it to TV, McMahon would realize that he wasn't quite ready yet and that if he really wanted his new star to make the impact he hoped he might, he would first have to send him to EC fucking for a while W so as to get some seasoning. So that was how in March of 19. Not even Paul Heyman could help him out. Not. Think. Of, wrap your mind around that. Not even Paul Heyman could get practice over. And he got everybody over in ECW. 1998, Brackus would return, only to then immediately lose his first match to Gold Dust on an episode of Shotgun Saturday Night. That's right, it wasn't the kind of debut you'd want out of a monster heel, and it didn't get much better from there as, after entering himself into the infamous Brawl for All later that year, he'd lose to Savio Vega in the first round, pretty much killing any of his tough guy aura right there. After that, he wouldn't be long for the company, as instead of main eventing with the likes of Steve Austin, Brackus would be working in lower card matches on the rare times he did appear on TV. And by the summer of 1999, he'd be gone altogether, with this marking an end to a run which could have been so much more. But the phrase could have been more can't necessarily be applied to our next Gunner Scott? Entry, as when Gunner oh, Scott made his yeah. debut on SmackDown in... Brent Albright, Gunner Scott... He had no chance that name. No chance. All of it did put him in a tag team with Chris Benoit, the man who should not be named, although I didn't name him. Was it Chris Benoit or was it William Regal? I forget. That's how unmemorable Gunnar Scott was. But they put him with somebody. I forget who. 2006, it soon became clear things were not going to go well. And that's a shame because by this point, Brent Albright, the man behind the character, had two years of seasoning time in Ohio Valley Wrestling, with him becoming years? both the OVW Heavyweight Champion, OVW Television Champion, and an OVW Southern Tag Team Champion while he was there. <laughs> and at least initially upon being moved up to the blue brand in 06, things would play out in much the same vein, as now being rebranded as Gunner Scott, he would make a quick impact when he scored a pinfall victory over Booker T. After that, he'd even get to partner up with Chris Benoit to take out... Oh, Hunter yeah, Finney, Chris Benoit. Was Gunner getting another they gave him a chance. The they were behind him. They tagged him with Chris Benoit. But his name, Gunner Scott, did not... He had no chance, is what I'm saying. ...time WCW champion here. In the end, however, this would prove to Hold be on. his high five-time the... WCW oh. champion here. In the end, however, this would prove to be his high point on the main roster as, following this, things would begin to falter, with it all eventually coming to a close in less than dramatic fashion, when upon losing a match to Mr. Kennedy that June, Kennedy. being destroyed by the great Kali after the bout and shoved into a body bag, the newcomer would be sent back down to OVW. And the reason for this was that feeling like he wasn't quite living up to the lofty expectations the company had for him, Vince McMahon would want him to get trained up some more before he made his eventual return. Of course, this return never, would happened. never happen in the end, as in October of that year, Gunnar Scott would be released from his contract, leaving him to have to seek employment in the likes of TNA, Ring of Honor, and Pro Wrestling Noah instead. But then he wasn't alone in this, as just a few years later, someone who had been making a name for themselves on the South the American hell? wrestling circuit, Eric Perez, would find an equal level of difficulty in WWE as Eric Escobar. I completely forgot about Eric Escobar. Jesus. What was that Survivor Series where he was part of the team? And then Vince McMahon looked at the team lineup and goes like, who the hell is Eric Escobar and took him out of the thing? Oh my God, he had no chance at all. Eric Escobar, and he was with somebody else. They had to change the whole lineup for that. He had the Survivor Series spot, but got taken away from him. Escobar. 
and this one would start in 2009 as, after having spent some time in both Deep South Wrestling and Florida Championship Wrestling, two of WWE's then developmental territories, Perez would be called up to the main roster, where he'd be asked to portray the new gimmick, with this one initially being based on the Jonathan Goldsmith character of the most interesting man in the world from the Dos Equis beer ad campaign. Dos Upon that idea being dropped, however, things would quickly be reworked as, instead, Eric Escobar became a more villainous cartel member-like figure, one who would find some early- Hold on, a cartel figure? That's Santos Escobar right now! Okay, they just recycled the gimmick. Well, they do recycle a lot of gimmicks, but yeah. Eric Escobar became Eric. Took Eric. He wasn't there, but you know what I mean. I'll shut up. <laughs> Eric Escobar became a more villainous cartel member-like figure, one who would find some early success over on SmackDown when he aligned himself with on-screen general manager Vicky Guerrero. On top of that, he'd also help build his stock by picking up wins over the likes of Matt Hardy at this point. Oh, great. Matt Hardy. The future was indeed bright for the Puerto Rican star. That, however, would all begin to change when, upon losing an Intercontinental title match to John Morrison, Vicky Guerrero would drop him, with this leading to Escobar turning face as a result. And while for many, a babyface turn would be a sign of good things to come, for the newcomer, it would mark the beginning of the end, as after losing a number of handicap matches against teams such as the Hart Dynasty and Jarrah Show, Escobar would be further punished by the GM when he was forced to go one-on-one -on -one with Kane on December 18th Kane! of that year. And after losing this one, he would be released from the company altogether, with him from there returning to the indie circuit where he would continue to make a living up until his retirement in 2015. But of course, Shame, he was a great wrestler WWE though. Who've given us some short lived gimmicks over the years, as back in 2001, WCW were putting out a team who, at least one half of, would later find much greater success. Air Paris. Inventor, and that was Air Raid. Air Raid. Yes, Air indeed. Paris and AJ Styles. A baby AJ Styles, a real baby AJ Styles, along with this dude. I don't know whatever happened to him, but god damn. This was the team made up of Air Paris and Air Styles, two young high flyers who, clad in G-suits, looked set to make a splash in the company's cruiserweight division upon their debut that February. And while they were indeed both very talented performers, with them at one point even gaining a victory over then WCW Tag Team Champions the Boogie Knights, things would never really get the chance to go much further than that. But this one can't really be blamed on the company as the reason for the gimmick's abrupt end they got bought out. just a month later, WCW would go under, with it being bought out by Vince McMahon from there. And deciding that he didn't want to keep the contracts of Air Raid going forward then, he would release both men, with them from there each journeying out onto the indie scene so as to make a name for themselves. Of course, each would do this to very different degrees in the years that followed, as while Air Paris would spend the next decade largely staying on the indies, Air Styles would make a major splash in both TNA and Phenomenal one. AJ Styles with him working with the former for a full 13 years, all before then jumping over to New Japan Pro Wrestling and taking over control of the Bullet Club from Prince Devitt. After that, he'd become an even bigger star, gaining worldwide notoriety, enough so that, in 2016, he could join WWE, and there, quickly establish himself as a major player, becoming a two-time WWE Champion in the process. So given what he would go on to do, it's easy to forget the humble beginnings that AJ had then, and the same, too, could really be said for another figure who would go on to have far greater success in the years that followed, because before he was the Attitude Era's favorite dancing Samoan... Hold, hold on, hold on. Are you going to give me Fatu? You can make a difference, Fatu? Please let it be Fatu. You can make a difference. Rikishi would be saddled with the gimmick of Make a Difference Fatu. Yes! So bad! Fatu, you can make a difference for the kids! <laughs> Two. Yes, this came after the Anawaii family member had undergone a successful run in the early 90s tag team division as one half of the Head Shrinkers. So, hoping to propel him towards equal levels of singles greatness following this then, Vince McMahon would recast Rikishi as Make a Difference Fatu in 1995, with his hope here being that, by portraying Rikishi as a positive role model, one who told kids to stay away from drugs and go to school, the big man would turn out to be a hit with the young audience watching at the time. Ultimately, however, even though the Attitude Era was still a few years away yet, the mid-90s audience would still find this one to be a little too forced and cheesy for their tastes, 
Even if the future innovator of the stink face tried his best to get it over by paying he tried. early wins he against tried. various enhancement talents on superstars. And while this was happening, a grander plan for the character would even begin to be teased, as throughout many of his matches, his real-life cousins Samu and Lloyd Anawaii, then known as the Samoan Gangsta Party, would start appearing in the audience during his matches. He, what? That Samu? Oh. would never oh. end up going any further than that, as by the time 1996 rolled around, it was clear that the die had been cast on the gimmick. Yes, after picking up some notable losses to the likes of Steve Austin, Vader, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley, the whole thing would be dropped. With make a difference spot too, and came the Sultan is equally as short of gimmick in the Sultan. Such shit. Still, Rikishi was able to ride this one out too, and a couple of years later, he'd finally get to make it to the main event. It's just a shame that the same can't be said for some of the other gimmicks in this video, as while not all of them were winners, a select few could have been far more than they were given the chance to be. And as for those like Roman Reigns or AJ Styles who did go on to greater things, even if, in their earlier incarnations, they'd almost gone forgotten forever. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button. Wrestle with Andy did another amazing, great job at this. I completely forgot about Brackus. Everybody forgot about Brackus, but goddamn, what a, what a trip through time. Eric Escobar. They had such good plans for him when he came. And then Vince McMahon just shit on it, literally. Well, he did shit on Janelle. Okay, enough Janelle jokes. He shit on it by saying, like, who the fuck is this kid on the Survivor Series lineup? Oh, my God. It could have been something. But now we have Santos Escobar. Different person. Yeah. I don't know what else to say, but God damn. You can make a difference, people. You can make a difference. Take it easy, Humanoid Nation. Humanoid out. Bye. Pasito a pasito, suave, suavecito, nos vamos pegando.